All right, perfect. So hello everybody. My name is Kelsey Baez. If we haven't met already, I am the Nutrition Wellcats uh, graduate student here at Texas State. So uh, a lot of what I do is um, help with uh, providing nutrition education. I do one-on-one -on -one consultations um, to move, help people with their nutritional goals. And of course, I do these uh, cooking classes. Uh, on here, we also have uh, Jessica. She is our um, uh, intern right now. Uh, she is... Uh, maybe she could just tell us a little bit about what, what she's doing in her role. Yeah, and so I'm in the dietetic internship through Texas State, um, and then I'm also in the graduate program for nutrition at Texas State as well. So um, I'm juggling through uh, some rotations, kind of like clinicals every couple of weeks, and I'm rotating with Wildcats this week, so perfect. So basically, um, we're going to have a lot of fun, nerdy nutrition talks today, I think is what's going to happen here. Um, so uh, as always, I invite you to just um, come off mute at any time that you feel ready and just engage in our conversation and um, ask questions along the way. This is meant to be an informal format. So uh, we're going to jump in here. I'm going to share my screen and um, we're going to start doing the... Uh, the recipe. We're going to start talking about the recipe. Um, let's see here. Oh, my Zoom's being weird again. I'm so sorry, you guys. All right. I will overcome this technology barrier, I promise. <laughs> All right. Would someone mind telling me, can you see the recipe? Yes. Yeah, yes, I can see it. Perfect, thank you. All right, so today we're gonna to be making a chicken pot pie. Calories per serving, um, and there's about four servings in a container, is gonna be 403 calories. Our protein is approximately 25 grams per serving, 10 grams of fat, and uh, 54 carbohydrates. Uh, ingredients that we're going to be using are listed here. Um, I'll show you as we go through them the different uh, things that we have, but um, we're looking at having extra virgin olive oil, mushrooms, carrots, celery, some garlic pepper, salt pepper, flour, almond milk, um, boneless chicken breast, frozen peas, which I need to grab out of my freezer, onion, thyme, a pie crust, and some lightly beaten egg. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And um, something that I like to do is take a moment to be able to show you guys different things and how I pre prepare um, for today. Um, I, all, I clean and wash all the vegetables beforehand, but I'll also do some prep. But then I also show you some tips and tricks on how to um, uh, gain more confidence with knife skills. So one thing I want to start off with showing you is that um, I bought pre-sliced pre mushrooms today. I did not cut them myself, but just so you know, whenever you clean them, you use a paper towel to wash, wipe them down instead of dumping them under water because they are porous and will hold onto that water and then it takes longer for them to cook. I just stepped out of frame because I have an electric stove and we're gonna be cooking in a cast iron skillet today, um, a lot of our things. So it's gonna take a while for that to heat up my pan. So I'm getting it started now. Um, Jessica, can you tell me what is the temperature for the oven? Is it 425? Yes. Perfect, thank you. All right. So I also have preheated the oven. That is going to be helpful as well. Um, I have a convection oven, so it'll cook a little bit faster than what the recipe says. Um, and I went ahead and uh, peeled our carrots and I already diced them. And I wanted to show you something that whenever you have um, maybe limited amount of time at dinner, like me, let's say maybe you're like me and um, you have a two-year-old that's running around and you can't stand around and be chopping vegetables all day in front of them. Um, I will prep them whenever I have some free time and then I set them in some water and that preserves them from browning. I do this with potatoes too. Um, but I wanna make sure 
Oh, you know what, Jessica? I think you're pinned and not me. Hello. All right, so I, what I wanna do is I want to show you how we're doing some cutting today. So we're gonna start off with the carrot. Now, as you can tell, you could use like baby carrots or already a sliced carrot, but um, if you use a large carrot like this, it's got different um, dimensions. It starts big and it goes smaller. So we're going to just cut that so that I have my bigger section and my lower and my smaller section. The reason why I'm doing that is because I want my cuts to be as even as possible. And I'm also gonna cut them relatively small. The reason why I'm cutting them small is because then I have more surface area whenever I put it in the pan and everything cooks faster. So I'm going for about this thick, ah, well, that one, but I'm going for about that thickness. Um, like I said, you could use like baby carrots and then you could just throw them in their hole and it'll take a little bit longer for it to cook, but you can most certainly do that. Now I'm using my hand and I have it parallel with the knife to make sure that I'm not cutting myself for the most part. And, and I'll show you with this onion with the onion, but you hold it differently, you hold your hand differently, <clears throat> but this is to save, stabilize it. And I'm just lining it up and I cut it this way and did that um, carrot cut in half because now I'm able to, I was able to um, control the size of it a little bit better. So I'm putting these into my water and I'm gonna drain my water here because I don't want to put them in the pan like that. And get them ready to go. Now the onion trick. I, I, I think I show this every, every trick every time because it's uh, popular. So um, there are these two parts of the onion. You've got the root side and this side that I always forget. I'm going to look it up, but the, this side of the onion. We're going to cut this side off first. Excuse me. And then we're going to cut it in half through the root. You have to do this onion trick this way because if you do it to where you cut um, the side the side that we remove first off, your onion's going to slip around. Now we are going to take this first layer off of the onion, and I'm I have a trash can right here. I'm not just randomly throwing stuff on my floor. I find that that setup is easiest for me. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have my hand on top of the onion with my knife underneath it, and I'm going to cut parallel to my hand or parallel to the board. So, and I'm not cutting it all the way through. I'm going to meet it to the, to where I have just a little bit of the onion still intact. And I'm going down roughly about, I'd say a quarter of an inch each way. And I'm doing that because it's setting up the framework for what my diced onion is going to look like. Now, same thing again, I'm not going to cut all the way through. I'm going to cut to the end here and I'm going to go um, <clears throat> perpendicular to the board and I'm going to keep my hand parallel to the knife. I'm getting a little thin there. Let's see. Now, when I dice my onion, that is good to go and it is easier. I, I think it's faster and you have less waste on your, on your onion. That's a little trick I learned while I lived in Spain. Um, my husband was in the Navy and um, while I never fed an army, I definitely fed the Navy. <laughs> and you learn how to cook really fast whenever you're cooking for lots of people over there. All right, next we need uh, the celery. I'm gonna chop the end off there and I'm gonna chop this end off. And then I'm, uh, if you notice, my onion pieces are about the same size that I cut my carrots and I'm gonna do the same thing for my celery. So here we go. I'm just cutting it into ribs. And then I'm gonna bunch them all together because that makes it go faster when I cut. And 
I'm just gonna, now I'm holding my hand so that my knuckles are like this so that I can never cut my finger. I mean, I guess you should never say never, but certainly uh, reducing the risk of it. All right, so we have our vegetables chopped. And that did not take too much time. And then our chicken. So for a chicken, you could of course make the chicken fresh from scratch, right? Um, but what I've done is I had a leftover rotisserie chicken and my rotisserie chicken is, um, I just pulled it off the bone here and put it in a container. And now I'm just gonna dice this up. It's just um, a way to make one meal <laughs> extend into more, into two. Um, and I'm dicing this up just because the way that I pulled it off the chicken, it was easier. If you wanted to shred chicken, you just take two forks and pull it together after it's freshly cooked. And we need eight ounces of this. And if you notice, I haven't been using um, measuring cups. The reason why is because I, uh, there is a visual method that you can use to um, cutting, or not cutting, but for portion sizes, which is something that um, I could go into more detail in if you wanted to do a one-on-one -on -one consult. But basically what's happening here is I know that three ounces of chicken is about the size of the palm of my hand. So uh, right here, I've got one palm in my hand and I have about two palms in my hands. So that means that I have six ounces. So I need to cut more because the recipe calls for eight, three palms is nine. So I'm going for roughly three palms. You can of course use a measuring cup, but um, I'm all about maxing, maximizing time in the kitchen. I know that um, the average American does not have much time to cook. So let's figure out how to cook and um, make it easier on ourselves. I'm sorry, this transition is always weird, but my prep station and my cooking station are in two different uh, locations. You can see I got the light on. All right, we're going to start off with putting our onion or our mushroom in the pan. Is that right, Jessica? I'm I was talking and I was muted. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, yeah, you already have oil in there, right? Is that what I'm seeing? Yep. I'm going to put some oil in there. Now I'm putting oil in after I cooked. I'm going to turn this down because that should not be smoking like that. So um, one, you could tell that your pan's hot by its smoking, which is not ideal. Um, <laughs> this, the second thing that you could do is if you're not sure, get your hand wet and throw some water on your pan. And that's going to help um, if it sizzles and you know that your pan's ready. I'm lifting this up to cool my pan down a little bit because that is way too hot. And I'm going to put my oil on there. I'm actually, I'm gonna move this over for a second. All right. Uh, another trick when you're cooking mushrooms is um, put the oil in your pan first and never put oil directly onto your mushrooms uh, because of the whole the fact that they are porous. So the, they're going to absorb that oil and it takes longer for them to cook and you're going to have to use way more oil than you may have in originally intended or wanted to use. Um, I'm going to step out of frame and get all my chopped, uh, all those chopped vegetables that we were talking about. Um, I know Jessica had some uh, some talking pieces prepared, so I'm going to let her go ahead and do that. I'm going to mute myself. Yeah, so I just wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about how you guys feel about cooking. Um, like, do you guys cook a lot at home, or what is what does y'all's home meal times kind of look like? For whoever's willing to share, I I, I enjoy cooking at home, and I enjoy. Uh, new recipes and figure out what I like about it and what I want to change about it. Um, I, I continue to make them over and over again if I do like them. So yeah. like in a rotation, you know, so. Sure. That's awesome. Where do you get like your inspiration for, for food? 
actually mainly from uh, these pan cooking classes. So oh, I've been that. going since, um, what's his name? Cord? No. Um, Colton. Colton. Oh, yes. Colton. Uh, to the actual classes in, you know, actually cooking there. Mm -hmm. And then when they started going to the Zoom, um, I did that as well. And uh, so I, I enjoy it. And then of course, you know, after you see recipes and you see where they're from, you're like, oh, well, I have these ingredients. Let me figure out what I can do and how I can make something healthy, you know, and right, right. all sorts of yeah. uh, different ingredients that I maybe wouldn't thought of, so. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that these uh, classes have been so helpful. Um, do you guys find any any meals to be specifically intimidating when you cook? Or any barriers like time or like personally, I, I've i never, it wasn't until recently that I started cooking shrimp. <laughs> for some reason that it was always kind of daunting for me. So I don't know if you guys have anything in particular. I used to cook a lot more than I do now. My oh yeah? Family, my family all goes like this in the evenings and my kids are growing up and, and you know, kind of doing their own thing. And so it's like, there's no one at home sometimes to even eat dinner and it's like so what's the point in cooking <laughs> yeah uh, sometimes I'll like cook it. and then you know my husband will eat the leftovers the next day you know for lunch or whatever um, but I've kind of gotten out of the habit of cooking and I kind of stalemate on what to cook mm -hmm. you know, coming up with ideas and things to cook yeah keeping it fun and different. And also uh, our eating patterns change throughout life. At some points you're cooking for one, like me, I, I don't have a family. And then all of a sudden you start cooking for your family and you have to start getting creative in different ways. And like you said, they, they grow up and then you got to switch around your patterns again. So that is definitely a, a barrier and something that um, it's also a positive because it help, helps you think outside the box and, um, yeah, you joining these classes is pretty awesome. Um, getting some inspiration like that and some tips. Well, and it's also nice if you have someone, I have a daughter that's in her 20s and over the summer when she was here at home, um, we would just quickly find recipes. Let's try something different. Let's do something. And most of the time it was just she and I eating it, but then my, the rest of the family were like, oh, well, let's try it, you know? And so that, that kind of helps. So she and I, you know, have this uh, love for, for food. So yeah, that's so fun. It's like having someone to share that with, that's like, you know what, we're just going to try it. That's mm -hmm. super fun. Yeah. I would agree. That's actually one of the ways that I learned to cook. So I passively said that I've cooked for a Navy before I was never in the Navy, but whenever we were overseas, what we would do a lot is um, we would actually uh, do potlucks. That's how we socialize with each other. And those potlucks are actually where I gained my confidence to cook and where I got many of the recipes that I use still today. So um, sometimes someone would be in charge of bringing the meat and the other person would be in charge of bringing the vegetable. And I, I would be like, well, Jessica brought coleslaw last week. So I need to figure out something other than coleslaw, <laughs> which is the one thing I know how to make now. And that's really how um, I was able to broaden uh, a lot of, that, of my, my cooking experience. Um, which is one of the reasons why I'm so excited about the pan class, because I feel like I get to bring that little piece of my history to you guys. Um, and I'd love to hear more about what you guys do too, or you all do. Um, yeah, I think we're missing those type of gatherings, you know, uh, those potlucks or Friday night dinners or whatever with your neighborhood or whatever, you know, so um, we do that with our family for different uh holidays you know people will will plan the menu ahead of time and everybody will contribute and sometimes you know every people will say oh oh but you always make that and you need to bring that you know so you kind of get stuck into okay I'll bring that again you know I want to try something new you know but yeah uh, people like their their comfort food so yeah definitely hear. I hear that um, something that I heard uh, earlier um, was mentioning about cooking for one and mm -hmm. how difficult that is. And um, while I talk a lot about my life with the family, um, I totally can understand and relate to that. Uh, one thing that's really helped 
is maximizing freezing. Um, so I actually, I don't know if you can see this back here in the corner. Uh oh, I turned off my oven. There we go. Um, but this, this machine that I'm showing back here, I mean, I'm not doing a promotion, but all I'm doing is saying that this machine, it freeze, it, it'll suck out the air on a lot of, um, uh, of the things that I make. And then what I'll do is I'll make a whole lot of food once, or if you're uh, someone who's cooking only for yourself, you're normally cooking to, for two people anyhow, because that's how things come in the store. And then I froze what, what I had left over. And then I'd have something easy for the next week. So it was almost like a passive meal prep. And then um, I was really only cooking like one day out of the week and then eating leftovers the rest of the week. Um, and then learning how to uh, incorporate those leftovers into fun, new, inventive things. So for instance, I told you how I turned this into a rotisserie chicken, turned the rotisserie chicken into this pot pie. It was chicken, rice, and broccoli, and now it's a pot pie. <laughs> um, so keeping that, that fun and that, that variety is also helpful, I, I feel. Yeah. And does anyone hear meal prep by chance? Has ever tried meal prepping? Thoughts on it? My daughter and I did that um, back in the fall. We took a Saturday and we meal prepped and did about 11 or 12 different meals. And I mean, it was okay. Um, we did a lot of things that were kind of a soupy type thing. Mm -hmm. um, some of them were good. Some of them weren't good. Mm -hmm. It was like, yeah, we'd eat this again. Yes, we really liked this. Mm -hmm. And most of them, we were doubling the recipe. So we were doing two. So we, I think we ended up with like 22 bags of stuff in my freezer. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, yeah. But sometimes yeah. because of the the recipe, it was designed for four where we were speeding six, mm. you know, at a time. So we would dump both bags in the crock pot, you know, and then there'd be a little bit left over for a lunch or two or, you know, a leftover dinner for whoever may have been at home the mm. next night or whatever. But um, we took a couple camping with us. So that made that easy because we just dumped it in the crock pot after breakfast and then it was ready at dinner time mm -hmm. you know while we were out doing hiking biking fishing whatever else we were doing while we were gone camping so that was good um I would do it again but it's just kind of hard to to kind of get in that routine she actually did the you know online store shopping and then went and picked it up so that kind of made it easy but I'm kind of one of those that I don't want those people picking my produce and stuff because um, I'm just kind of picky about that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I see who's shopping when I go to the store. I see who's doing that shopping. And it's like, that kid doesn't know anything about produce. <laughs> you know, so I was kind of, you know, kind of one of those things. So it's like, I'm hesitant about, you know, just putting it all online and letting somebody else throw all the stuff in my basket. But yeah, um, there's pros. And that was really easy because she picked it up. We brought it home and, you know, there was the two of us were there and um, we had all our bags and we used um, pitchers, like tea pitchers or Kool-Aid pitchers. Mm -hmm. And I had an oval shaped one, which we put our Ziploc bag inside. So then you just dumped everything into it. And um, that made it really easy and convenient, you know, to put everything in. And so, um, you know, we spent, uh, I don't know, maybe an hour or so prepping all the vegetables. And then it was okay, we need, you know, this for this one, this for this one, and this for this one. And we would kind of line them up. And then, you know, so we were doing you know, two or three recipes at one time, you know, mm -hmm. two pictures for this one and two for this one. And um, so, I mean, it went pretty good. We spent most of the day doing them. 
Yeah. Um, you know, so, I mean, it, it did take quite a bit, but we ended up with a lot of food in the freezer. Right. Yeah. And um, sometimes I feel like people think that meal prepping is like um, the ideal gold standard. Um, but it, you can just do it whenever you get the chance. You're like, oh, I have this free Sunday. And then you can, if you have the means to go to the store and do it however you please and make it a fun day. Um, you can always, like Kelsey said earlier, utilize freezing. Um, you don't have to eat what you meal prepped that entire week. Cause then it gets really repetitive and you're like, why did I do this? Um, yeah, I, I do that with a lot of different things. Like the other day I opened up, um, you know, uh, a five pound thing of hamburger meat while I was making tacos for dinner, but I also seasoned it with like hamburger seasoning so that I could make like cheeseburger quiche, you know, in the next day or two. So um, that way, I mean, I, I, and then I put a little bit of the, uh, the meat raw into a bag and threw that into the freezer. And so, you know, it's ready to go for something else, but um you know, I got to do that too with my, my hamburger meat, if I'm cooking it, it's like, okay, so what am I going to use this for and try to think in advance and just cook it all at one time and season it differently, you know, if you can or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, um, I, my meal prep, uh, often is just, I chop some vegetables and then I throw it in that, that way yeah. and I freeze some. Um, so it doesn't have to always be a very big extravagant, yeah. uh, 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 movement. Uh, I do want to tell you guys some things that I was doing while we were talking um, that I thought may be helpful to know. So, so far I've added in garlic, some salt, I added in the almond milk, and I've whisked up our eggs. So, um, do you ever get on your um, shakers, little buildup around here? Mm -hmm. That buildup is because you're putting it directly over the, well, I mean, not only, but it's because you're putting it directly over the pan usually because this steam is going to make your, your um, powder clump up. So that's one of the reasons I'll dump it into my hand and then you can do those visual visuals again. So I knew that I think this was a tablespoon, which is the size of your thumb, like this part of your thumb. So I put it in my hand and then just did one of these numbers and then I was able to get my, get everything in there. Um, I did the same thing with salt. Um, it was a quarter. So that's roughly about the size of your pinky, the end of your pinky. Um, and if you have been with me in the past, whenever we do a pan, whenever we've done these previous pan classes, I normally talk about um, not putting salt into our food while we're cooking it and that we salt our food after we prepared it. Uh, the reason why I put salt in this food today is because it um, has this liquid in there. So it's going to help our veggies cook faster whenever we put it in the oven. So it doesn't need a lot. It was just that quick uh, teaspoon, but it does give it a component uh, that is going to make the, make it cook faster um, and help us out basically. Uh, we were looking to have a good rolling boil happen in our milk and in, in our milk here. Um, I would like for it to be a little thicker, but I will be honest that we're, uh, that I need to put this in the oven. So I'm going to throw it in there and we're going to see how this goes and we can learn from my mistake if it didn't work out well. Um, I mixed up an egg and I want to show you this as well, because, um, this is something that I didn't know a lot of people didn't know, but if you look at my egg, notice there are no stringy things. Uh, I, I was whisking it, so I should have saved it, but you'll see like there will be white lines in here. You want to miss whisk your egg so that there's none of that and it's mixed together because it's going to help with the protein reactions inside of your, inside of your, um, meal. So I need to add a little bit of water because that's what the recipe calls for. And then we're going to brush our pan. That was about a tablespoon of water. And again, visual methods something I'd be more than happy to help uh, explain more. I'm going to use this, uh, basically a paintbrush, to put my egg wash on around here. And um, I know that I keep telling you all these really cool sciencey things about why we do things. I'm not sure why you do the egg wash, but I know that you have to. 
Um, I think it's to keep the crust crispy, but don't uh, hold me accountable to that. Does that make the crust stay up on the pie pan, maybe? That I, it's what I think that it, it keeps it so that it, I think that what it does is it makes it so that it doesn't um, stick to the pan. So okay. It's, okay, so you're putting that in without a bottom crust. I am. You could put okay. a, you could put a bottom crust in there. Um, I'm, 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 I'm not. <laughs> so when, when you do an egg wash on crust, isn't that to make it brown? That is part of the component, yes. Yeah. But you you just put that on the side of the bowl. Is that what you did, Kelsey? I did. I did. Yes. And then whenever I put the um, whenever I put the dough on, which I was going to show you the packaging, um, I just bought a pre pre made dough, which is this Pillsbury one. I didn't know these existed till like a not too long, not too far off, not too long ago. So I wanted to share that. Um, but. I'm sorry, Adam. What was the original question? Why do I put so, on the bottom? Uh, oh, go ahead. I don't think you were answering my question. Oh, okay. Uh, what were you? Was she Jessica? I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, I think we're talking about egg wash, um, but I'm not really sure what uh, the egg wash does, but I, I do know it does have to do with browning. And if you're putting it on the edges, it makes sense that it helps like lift it and crispy up the sides. But I'm, there's probably something more technical to it. But yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So the recipe says uh, to lay the, um, this is a hot pan, so I'm sorry, I'm not going to pick it up. But lay it and then lay your pie crust on there and then uh, leave about an inch and a half around the border. But for the most part, aside from one little area, it's actually already doing that, if you can see. Um, so I'm not going to cut it, but just something to be aware of that that stuff is in there. It's just my pre-made is already um, ready for that. So I'm going to bring this in here. And then I'm going to do my egg wash. And then we're going to cut some uh, holes, some slits into it. And then we're going to throw it in the oven. Have you guys, um, does anyone here have experience with making uh, pies or pot pies in the past? My daughter and I were making pies at Christmas time and our our pie crust kept shrinking. Uh, we tried pie weights and you really have to have a whole lot of pie weights when you blind bake. And even still with some of those filling up the pie plate, they still, some of them shrunk down. I don't know if it was because the crust wasn't big enough for the pie plate or what, I'm, I'm, I'm more of a cake baker, cookie, cupcake kind of person than a pie person. Yeah. So we were kind of at a loss. <laughs> yeah, I will be honest and tell you that I have never made a pie with a top on it. So this is just fun for all of us. <laughs> we found a recipe over the holiday for a chicken pot pie. It's similar, but you make it in a, um, like a, nine by 13. Okay. And, and um, it's very similar to what you just did. The difference is they, you, they told us to use um, phyllo dough for the top. Oh, yes. Um, I believe I, it's a crispier. Yeah. Am I saying, am I saying that right? Phyllo dough? Phyllo? Yeah. I yeah. believe so. so phyllo or um, phyllo. Phyllo or phyllo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we made it. It was amazing. I have a niece who's a freshman in college and she loves chicken. Like it's her favorite thing. And she's a real healthy eater. And she came over that night and she said, this is the best thing I've ever had in my life. <laughs> yeah. Phyllo pastry is real flaky. Yeah. It was delicious. Yeah. It was delicious. It's layered and thin. Yeah. Yeah. It's and we did the same a, a thing. Croissant. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It didn't quite do that on the top of the chicken pot pie, but it was just delicious. I mean, it was really, really good. Um, so we made it again a couple weeks after that. It's a good recipe. 
and there's a lot of leftover so you could eat it a couple times which if you like leftovers <laughs> uh, based on our earlier conversations you guys know my stance on leftovers so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do want to show you guys um, this like, oops, earlier you guys were talking about like cooking for two and whatnot. So I only cook for like one or two and I have this foodie. I don't know if I've seen it. It is uh, on the pricier end, but it is a uh, pressure cooker, a steamer, a slow cooker. It bakes, air crisps, broils. You can saute, dehydrate and make yogurt. Like you could do anything you can desire <laughs> with that one thing. And it is the size of about like, two to three chicken breasts in there. So, and it doesn't take, you don't have to preheat an oven. Um, there are also like two levels to it. So I'll cook vegetables on the bottom and then chicken on the top or vice versa. Um, and it's all in one pan. So sometimes when I used to cook, I felt like I dirtied every dish that I owned. Um, and I was just like, man, just for me, like, um, so this has changed my life. Basically, I'm, um, I only like clean two dishes after I cook. Um, and yeah, it's, I, I need, I can, sometimes I can bake things and then if I want to crisp it up a little bit more, I'll just change it to an air crisp and, um, it is pricey, but I've had it for like a year and it has been the best thing, <laughs> uh, trying to cook for, for two. I think that's, um, one of the, one of the uh, really cool things about cooking is that, um, as you get more comfortable in your wheelhouse, you start learning about different um, machines or anything that uh, you may find more more helpful or not. So um, something that I can think of off the top of my hand, aside from what Jessica said, is like I I love garlic, <laughs> and any recipe that I find is going to have probably triple the amount of garlic that you see in there. Uh, my my family's on board with it, so no complaints. Uh, but I, I um, because of my uh, continuous use of cooking, I found that there is something called a garlic press. So then I started using a garlic press. But um, but you can, I mean, there's always different ways to do it. So it doesn't require a fancy machine to be able to live and have a health have a healthful lifestyle. But you do end up. Uh, noticing that there are things that you may want to invest in that you would find easy for you. Um, and finding that balance is always fun, fun to explore. Uh, just, just my little two cents on that. <laughs> for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah. just so y'all know, it is in the oven. I cut the slits while we were talking. Um, it is in a convection oven. So in a regular, um, the, the standard American oven is a conventional oven. In a conventional oven, um, it, the recipe says it's going to take about 25, 30 minutes. Because mine's a convection oven, um, it more than likely is going to cook faster. So I'm going to just keep an eye on it. I set a timer for about 15 minutes, and then we'll go from there and see how, how it is. Um, the difference between a conventional and a convection oven is the way the heat's distributed within, a, within, within the oven itself. So with a conventional oven, your heat is radiating down or up onto your dish. With a convectional oven, it's circulating around it. So because it's moving and it's circulating around it, around it, um, it cooks at a more, well, it, it just, it cooks at a different rate because it's displacing that heat all around the dish rather than just on top and on bottom. Um, that is something that took me a really long time to understand. Uh, that there is a difference between those two. And uh, I just wanted to share, share that knowledge in case maybe uh, you didn't know the difference either. So do you find that it, it doesn't burn the top of things uh, or not burn, but like make things a lot crispier on top before the bottom is, is cooked? I, I actually don't in my experience. So, um, I find that if something's burnt on top, it's usually, or on, or in some aspect it's burnt, it's because I left it in there too long because I'm so used to cooking in a conventional oven that adjusting to a convection oven is really cool, but <laughs> there, there's a learning curve there. I would say that I've had to relearn how to cook a good four different times in my life. And that would be based off what types of pots and pans I've had available to me at that time, what type of, uh, 
cooking units I have. Um, there's people here in America that may only have access to a microwave and being able to help and uh, teach people how to cook on a microwave or a single burn top, single uh, stove top burner, which is something I had to do in Spain. <laughs> Everything went into one pot basically on a, on a burner. Um, so just learning to have those different, those different components uh, is, is a, is a challenge, but it's something that we can definitely overcome. <laughs> Do, has anyone else felt like they've had to relearn cooking? Like you thought you, you thought you had it down and then something showed up and just changed it for you. <laughs> yeah. I remember um, moving different apartments and um, like one oven would get really hot and then one wouldn't. And then you have a favorite burner that only that one burner gets hot and that you cook everything on that one, even though you have four burners. <laughs> so I haven't had to recook, learn how to cook in my life, but I'm still on like step one of the first time I learned how to cook. <laughs> um, the, the positive of like not cooking for a ton of people and, um, obviously like we miss like cookouts and potlucks and such, but I have found um, a positive in this time that I can make meals and they can turn out terribly. Like I can just try something new and it, it can be terrible. And um, it's okay because it, it's just me and it wasn't under any sort of pressure. And um, it gives me more freedom to attempt things without um, all the other things. I totally and I can, can deal with that because I've tried things and it's like, okay, sorry, that didn't turn out the <laughs> way I thought. Next time I'll do this. And, you know, but they'll still eat it. <laughs> right, right. It's My easy to like, used to say okay. when, when she would make something new, she would, she would always just say, no guarantees. <laughs> <laughs> uh, love that. Yeah, it's definitely me too. Um, so that's always uh, something whenever you're cooking for a lot of people where you're like, man, I just really hope this tastes okay. Um, and having that weight lifted right now during this um, pandemic has been nice as well. Um, my daughter always tells me I need to taste my food while I'm cooking it because I can cook a whole meal and never taste it, you know, or cook some dish and put it all together and never taste it until it's done. You know, mm -hmm. and she's, no, mom, you need to start tasting that. We were on a mission trip one time and we were making lunch while the teams were out working and we were making chocolate sheet cake and we were making two. So I put one together and put it in the oven. We started the second one and she stuck her finger in the, in the batter and tasted it and went, oh, mom, there's something missing. Oh, I know what it was. She was licking the bowl and she goes, get that out of the oven. <laughs> We had forgotten to put the sugar in it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and so we pulled it out of the oven real quick. It hadn't been in there but just a minute or two. And so I didn't even take it. I don't remember if I took it out of the pan or not. But we added the sugar and, and put it back in there. But one time my husband uh, was trying to make chicken and dumplings. He knew that was the plan for the dinner. And I was late. And his dad was over. And so um, he got the stuff all out to, to make chicken and dumplings and he was rolling it out. And he said, man, this is just not rolling very well. And he tasted the batter or I came in and saw the container that he had used for flour or something. I don't know which it was, but he'd used powdered sugar to make dumplings with so oh, he, he was scrapping it and starting all over because he didn't know which one was powdered sugar and which one was flour because <laughs> he doesn't usually cook you know so I I know which containers which and which shelf which one goes on and it was mm -hmm. funny we all laugh and so now that's the big joke around our house is dad makes dumplings with powdered sugar made uh pancakes from scratch once and put like uh double 
triple maybe the amount of baking soda you're supposed to. So we were eating them and they almost taste like a German pretzel and they made us all burp a lot. <laughs> so there's definitely those learning curves. And um, while there is no harm in trying our food whenever we, uh, whenever we're cooking it, we do need to be aware of things like raw egg or something that may be in it that um, increases our risk to path pathogens um, and different viruses and bacteria. Um, and the other component of that is, I don't know if this happens with anyone else, but whenever I eat, when I cook, uh, frequently what happens is I eat so much testing it that whenever it comes time to eat, I'm not ready to eat. I'm full, but then I made all the food and I feel like I have to eat it and I have to eat it all off of the plate. So then I end up eating way more than I would have if I would have just waited to plate my food before. Um, so just something to be aware of for yourself, because if you can do a quick sip and go, great. That is just not, <laughs> not something uh, that all of us can do. <laughs> I see um, some, I have, oh, okay. Bye, Janet. Thank you for joining us. And I read a tablespoon of baking powder once. Uh, <laughs> it made a difference for sure. Yes. Yeah. It does. Um, I saw an, uh, on here that uh, uh, a struggle that someone had mentioned is finding good produce that, um, that is organic. Um, something that I, I definitely agree is a barrier whenever someone's cleaning, picking out your own, uh, your, your fruits and vegetables is the fact that um, you don't get control over that quality that you may want. Um, other great options to consider aside from fresh um, vegetables is um, canned and frozen vegetables and fruits. Um, I know that they get the stigma for not being healthy, but uh, that's actually uh, not true. So whenever we look at frozen fruits and vegetables, a lot of times what they're doing is they're picking them fresh from their um, source, tree, plant, whatever. And then they're immediately flash freezing them, which means that it's actually preserving those nutrients in there um, at its peak ripeness. Um, as opposed to if we're looking at on a, a shelf, we may not know how long that, that um, fresh fruit or vegetable was sitting on the shelf and then how long it's gonna sit in our refrigerator. And some of those um, vitamins and minerals may degrade. So um, while you're still gonna get great nutritional components, from fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, you don't have to discount the fact that you can have like low sodium canned sources and you can also have frozen sources and then still be completely part of a healthful diet. Um, and organic uh, specifically, I would say is a personal, uh, a personal choice, uh, but uh, organic does not necessarily mean more healthy. But there are different components that go into organic that um, can play into an influence on whether or not you choose to have those or not. Um, I am going to check on our, our pie. It's looking a little bubbly, but the crust looks ready. I think that the, I should have cooked the milk longer is what's gonna happen. But for the sake of time, I think I'm gonna give it another minute and then I'm gonna pull it out, let it cool off. And I'll tell you about like the flavor components that I'm getting in there. I just remembered that I forgot to put the peas in and they were, <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> that definitely affected the protein content in my dish. <laughs> But um, as we have talked about, uh, like Bob Ross would say, which just a happy mistake, we'll be fine. <laughs> um, oh, something else I just noticed uh, that I wanted to talk to you guys, to you all about um, was the salt that I use. So um, I use sea salt because uh, I, it's just a taste that I like. It, it, it has a little bit more of a salty taste in like a traditional table salt would. But I specifically buy iodized salt. Um, and the reason why I do that is because regular table salt has um, iodine in it, which is one of our, it is something essential that we need in our diet. So whenever we switch, if, if you switch to a different sea salt, just make sure that you're making, that you're getting that iodine from different sources. Um, one of mine is through salt, but um, a seafood is also a great component for iodine as well. 
Uh, but whenever you sw uh, switch off of tables, like traditional table salt, if that's something you want to do, there's nothing wrong with traditional table salt. Um, just just be sure to be influxing uh, I, I, uh, iodine from someone from another source. I think the iodine is is helpful for thyroid. Uh, yeah. Yes, that is one component to it. Um, it, it. No, that's a that's a major component to it, actually. All right, I'm gonna pull this out. Ooh, it is bubbly, bubbly. It looks good, and that crust is crispy. Oh no, can you see that it's bubbling? Oh, it looks. All right, I, on the camera, I know it looks really white. <laughs> it's not, <laughs> I'm not good. I'm not about to eat raw dough. I'm not, <laughs> it's golden. Um, I don't know if I move it closer, if that'll change the way it looks. Let's see. That helped it a little bit, but you can see how there's, oh, see. there's bubbles and stuff happening um, on, well, within and on top. But if I left it in later, uh, longer, of course it would be more golden, but that that is not raw. So I'm gonna turn off my oven because it is making me hot. Going to get a plate. And then I'm gonna, um, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and plate it. And we're just gonna see how that goes. Oh, I'm trying to get a knife. We're getting an early start on St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> with all of this. Okay, let's see here. Well, Kelsey, I was going to say for just for getting to put the peas in, you do a great, really good job of trying to cook in front of us. Uh, I know when I when I'm cooking, if people are, you know, distracting me and bothering me, I know I'm going to forget something. But, you know, and it's like, oh, no, I forgot to put that in, you know. <laughs> Blame well, it on someone you. else. <laughs> I appreciate the compassion. <laughs> <laughs> I try to study it, remember it, and um, and have everything out and ready for me. But I didn't want to have frozen peas sitting out, and uh, that played a factor into everything. Um, let's see here. All right, so I'm trying to lift it off. That first piece is always so hard to get out. All right, it's oops. So definitely need to cook it for uh, longer while it's in the pan so that it bubbles. It is somewhat of a soup in here right now. And the fact that I'm taking it out and not letting it cool for like five minutes before I serve it is also another reason why it's so soupy. But my, my vegetables and everything are cooked. My, my um, dough is cooked. So it is definitely safe to eat. I'm gonna, I'm gonna slide it. I have you on stand, and sometimes a stand doesn't like to cooperate. Okay, there we go. All right, so it's it's not as pretty as I usually show you guys, but let's see. Make it look like that. Oh, okay. So we've got our different um, carrot, we've got our mushroom, the, the celery, and then I'm just gonna take a bite and try and get a little bit of everything in here because I want to know what it tastes like all mixed together. And I don't wanna burn my face while doing it. This is, this is pretty good. I think I would use less celery, but also because I don't have those peas in there, that pea would probably mute the celery a little bit too. So just take that into consideration. The flavors together are really good. Um, that sauce definitely needs to be thicker for you to get, uh, for, to get that uh, component to, to come across. Um, How is the um, almond milk in it? Because sometimes when I cook almond, with almond milk, it doesn't, it has this almondiness that doesn't replicate milk the same way. What are your thoughts with that? 
So I do, I do get a little hint of the almond, but I actually, I actually like it uh, okay. whenever you're combining it with the, with the crust itself, because the crust is very buttery. So then you have that buttery taste with the, with a little bit of that almond flavor. It actually, it, it, it combines really well. Um, yeah, I wonder, I do also wonder if maybe a little bit more flour would be helpful whenever you're putting it into the, into the skillet. And because um, with that almond milk, um, I, I just didn't see it thickening up as I would with a regular milk, um, like a, from, from a cow. So I'm, I'm wondering if the fact that it was almond milk is also part of the reason why it was so soupy. For sure. Um, which you could combat by, by putting just a little bit more flour in, uh, mm -hmm. it's really whatever your, your preference or, is. Or could you reduce the amount of milk as well? Yeah, certainly. <clears throat> certainly there was, it was a hefty portion of milk. So yeah. cups, maybe doing like half a cup or maybe even only a cup. Yeah. You could always add more in if it was, um, not distributing well. And as for like maintaining nutritional value, um, 1% milk and almond milk are pretty similar, I believe. So 1% would probably be ideal other than like whole, just to like keep a similar nutritional value. They would, I think that the 1% milk actually has a little bit higher protein content. So if that is something that you're focusing on, you would get a little bit more um, from that aspect, but everything else I think is relatively matched the same. For sure. So um, it is past 1.30, so we are past our hour mark, and I'm sorry that we went a little over today, but we really wanted to bring you this pot pie. <laughs> um, it, I'm still going to stay on, so if you have any questions, I'm here, um, but aside from that, I hope that you guys have a wonderful day, and if you get to celebrate spring break, have a wonderful break, and don't forget to take care of yourselves, too. All right, well, thank you, Kelsey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye.